Welcome everybody to our VBC happy hour on this Valentine's Day Eve. My name is Todd DePastino. I am the director of the Veterans Breakfast Club, and we do this program every Monday night where we have conversations with veterans. And tonight we are marking Black History Month uh, and by inviting Black Vietnam veterans to come and talk about their experiences and also have a content expert, a historian, Samuel Black, who is joining us, who is the director of the African American History Museum here in Pittsburgh. Uh, we'll get to that conversation shortly, but I'm, we're still letting people in from the waiting room, and that takes a little while. And I thought I'd use this time to introduce myself for those who have not joined us before. My name is Todd DePastino. I'm the director of the Veterans Breakfast Club. We're a nonprofit that has been in Pittsburgh uh, since 2008, holding events where veterans come and share their stories with the public. And it's been a wonderful experience getting to know thousands of veterans over the years and hearing their stories. I'm not a veteran. I am, I guess what you would call a veteran groupie, which makes me a little strange. I, there's nothing more than I, than, than there's, I, I love nothing more than being with a group of veterans and hearing their stories. And what it allows me to do, not being a veteran, is to kind of ask a lot of questions, a lot of maybe stupid questions that that um, veterans wouldn't ask themselves, because our whole purpose is to connect veterans with the public. Uh, we want these conversations to be open to the public. We want people like me who don't come from military families, don't aren't veterans, haven't served. We like people like me to come and ask questions and listen and get to know our veterans and hear the stories of service. The idea is to educate and inspire people like me and, and connect and perhaps heal uh, the veterans who, who join and share uh, their stories. So thank you very much to all of you who are joining us here on Zoom and also on YouTube and Facebook. And I should let everybody know that these programs are, are then archived on our YouTube channel. We could find them and uh, watch them or rewatch them anytime. Uh, we have we depend heavily on our sponsors, and we are very grateful to two special sponsors who have been backing and sponsoring our our uh, Veterans Breakfast Club programs here online for a long time. One of them is D and D Auto Salvage. They are a, uh, a, a state of the art metal recycling facility uh, with two locations in Western Pennsylvania. Um, one in Tarentum and one in Lawrenceville. Uh, they're a family owned uh, company that uh, handles individuals as well as uh, industry recycling. And you could, they're very proud of being longtime supporters of veterans and especially Veterans Breakfast Club programming. And you can find out more about DD Auto Salvage on their website dndautosalvage.com. That's dndautosalvage.com. And then of course we have Adagio Health, which provides health, wellness, and nutrition services and support throughout Pennsylvania and seven counties in West Virginia. And Tobacco Free is the program that is dedicated to preventing and reducing tobacco use and increasing education about tobacco hazards and secondhand smoke. You could find out more about what they do. And if you are addicted to tobacco, you could uh, quit with their help by using their quit line, 1-800-QUIT-NOW. That's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And you could learn more at tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. That's tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. Let me let you, let me tell you about um, the ground rules here, the program. We have, we mute everybody when they come in from the waiting room and then request that if you want to say something, ask a question, uh, you know, join the conversation. We ask that you raise your hand, and you could raise your hand uh, virtually uh, in four different ways, depending on what kind of device you're using. If you're using a desktop computer or a laptop, you could go down to Reactions down here, and uh, you just click that, and you'll see Raise Hand. You click that, and that'll pop up a hand in your in the top left corner here of your uh, of your zoom and it'll for me it will boost you up into the top of my gallery and I'll be able to see you and ask you to unmute uh, if you are using a, a tablet you go up to the right to participants 
and then down to this little hand down here, raise hand, you can raise your hand that way. If you are on your phone, and many people are, uh, you could go down to more, three little dots, click that, raise hand. And then finally, if you're dialing in, and people do that also, star nine, star nine will raise your hand, star nine will take it down. And what that does is it allows us to, allows me to recognize uh, you and ask you to unmute. And listen, our programs are highly interactive. Man, we had a great one last week on Space Force. Questions being fired from all over the Zoom room. That is just the way we love it. We love to have new people join us. We love to have people chime in, share their stories, and also ask questions about what has been said. So please do, um, don't hesitate to raise your hand. We just use that feature to avoid the cacophony <clears throat> that is often uh, a problem um, uh, with, uh, with these Zoom conversations if people aren't unmuted. Now, one more thing. I want to um, share one more thing before we get started with Sam Black and others. I get these, I get things every once in a while, all right? Pictures. Jim Roberts sent this to me. Jim Roberts, Vietnam veteran, Army veteran. And he said, Todd, can you guess what this is? It's a picture of a device, a military device. He said, this could have been my father's. His father was in the Air Force, or it could have been mine. I can't remember. And I asked him for a hint, and he did give me a hint. I'm guessing that many of you know what this thing is. It seems to have, oh, look at Brad. Look at Brad. Okay. We're getting the answers here in the chat. Uh, thank you, Bill Boswell. And I, I need to introduce Brad Washerball. He's my wingman for tonight. 28-year yeah. Marine Corps veteran, retired as a colonel. Brad, what is this item? That is a collar stay. So <clears throat> you attach that on the underside of your collar, and it keeps the tabs flat and against your shirt. And it, the tie goes over it, so it makes you look pretty spiffy. I can't picture it. I mean, I could, I, let's see. Okay. So. so you put your collar up high like that and you put those two prongs on the corner, then you flip it down and it keeps your collar flat. Oh, okay. And, is this <laughs> and if you bend at it in the middle, just right, it'll make your tie protrude a little bit. So you have a nice tie, tie knot there and it just kind of sticks out. So there's a real art in doing these things. And usually second lieutenants, they come out looking like a uh, wired jumbo. They just get so frustrated. They go through, you know, they bend them up where they're not even serviceable and they throw it. And they, but it's it, it takes a, a practice to do it right. So you wore one of these, Colonel? Definitely. A absolutely. I mean, if you're if you're a squared away Marine, uh, you're going to have one of those on. Your uniform is going to be looking sharp and it goes right down to every detail. That's very good. So it's called a collar stay. Collar stay, a collar yeah. stay. Right. Wonderful. Okay. And officers wear them, I take it, rather than enlisted? Any any Marine can wear them. So okay. but usually usually you find that the young officers struggle with them most. And it usually takes a NCO or a staff NCO to show the lieutenant how to wear it properly. Okay. Good. Very good. Thank you for that. Okay, we will have further conversation about that later. Right now, I want to say and welcome Samuel Black. Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Sam is the director of the African American History Museum here in Pittsburgh, part of the John Hines uh, History Center. And he's also a, a, a historian, a curator, a writer uh, with many, many years experience in uh, museum work and in editing and publishing. Uh, he's the author of three books, a true expert on the Vietnam War, and especially on the Black experience during the Vietnam War. And he's actually the author of uh, this book, which is called Soul Soldiers, the Afri African Americans in the Vietnam Era. It's how I first learned about this subject. Sam, thank you for joining us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. You know, you are not a veteran, but your brother served in Vietnam. Can you tell us a little bit about him and his service? Yeah, uh, his name was Jimmy McNeil, and it's not short for James. He was actually named Jimmy. Right. He had a brother named Jimmy and a brother named Ronnie. 
So it's not James or Ronald. It's Jimmy and Ronnie. <laughs> um, and uh, it's like Joe Trotter at Carnegie Mellon University. He's not Joseph. He's Joe. Joe. Um, right. And so, uh, but he's six. He was sixteen years older than me. I was born in '61, and um, and I was born in in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, Jimmy was my mother's firstborn, um, and so he was born in North Carolina. Um, where my mother was born and, and grew up and where she met my father. My father was actually in the uh, 82nd Airborne during the Korean conflict um, and was stationed in North Carolina. Um, and um, and I think it, as the story goes, he met my mother at a military party um, and, um, uh, and they fell in love and got married. Um, and so, uh, uh, but Jimmy uh, was raised in North Carolina with my grandmother. Um, and I and my other 11 siblings were let, raised in Cincinnati, Ohio uh, with our parents. Um, I, uh, as a matter of fact, I don't know what they call this, uh, but I was born um, in 1961 in January. I had two twin sisters who were born on Christmas day, 1961. So as an infant, I was sent to North Carolina to be raised by my grandmother. And, um, and so I spent the first three, almost four years of my life uh, with my brother. Um, and so the uh, actual memories I have of him are very cloudy, very faint memories of being of that young age. And I had to verify um, my memories with my grandmother and conversations with her who who basically said, yes, that was true. You weren't making that up or dreaming about that or anything like that. But his Vietnam experience, he, he after high school in, uh, at Fuquay High School, which was uh, located in Fuquay, North Carolina, about 10 miles south of Raleigh uh, in Wake County, um, uh, he uh, took a job with a local, um, I guess today you call it a communications uh, company or public works, whatever it is, um, but they were doing uh, telephone lines there. And uh, shortly after that, he decided to enlist and he joined the um, 393rd uh, Signal Corps um, uh, in the uh, um, 1965, and actually did two tours in Vietnam, uh, 65 through 67. And um, uh, but he did his basic training at Fort Gordon, um, and then was sent to Vietnam. And um, you know, so I had a picture of him, um, two pictures: one in Fort Gordon. Um, and then the other in Vietnam. And those pictures used to be on our living room wall at home. And that's really what I knew of him, you know, for the rest of his life. He um, uh, uh, left Vietnam in, in 67 and um, uh, decided to join the um, Army uh, Reserves uh, in, I think, 1970 or so. And, um, and was planning to um, go back to Vietnam. He's planning, I don't know if he could do this, but uh, I'm still trying to piece together his military experience. Um, but he was planning to go back to Vietnam. So he was on his way to Cincinnati to visit his family um, in, in 1971. Uh, and unfortunately he was killed in New York City. So I always thought that it, you know, you know, how uh, you know, terrible it was for someone to do two tours in Vietnam uh, and then be killed on the streets of the United States uh, in September 1971. And, um, and so I remember as a child, you know, I didn't attend his funeral um, uh, that was held in North Carolina. But of course, my mother and my father did, and my older siblings did. Um, uh, I was 10 years old at the time. And um, uh, but what I what I remember was he was he was my door to the Vietnam War. 
Yes. He was all I knew about the war. He and right. Walter Cronkite. Right. Uh, and I really didn't understand Walter Cronkite because I was just a child, you know, and you're watching it on the news and you really, at, at that young of age, um, you really didn't understand it. No one really talked about it. Um, and especially after his death, we really didn't talk about the circumstances surrounding his death, nor, um, you know, his military service. It wasn't until, you know, the early 2000s when I started this research and um, I wasn't initially intended to do anything or include my brother's story uh, in that work. Mm -hmm. But what I was looking at was the impact of the Vietnam War on Black families and Black communities. And so um, I'm looking at, you know, what was it really like yeah. uh, in these families and communities to be struggling with a civil rights movement at the same time you're struggling with Vietnam and then a whole lot of other, as I began to meet veterans and talk with veterans, a whole lot of other questions um, began to come up that I sort of folded into the research into the exhibit, you know, the things that I really wanted to, to um, talk about. So so my work was primarily um, almost like a, a social um, approach to looking at the Vietnam War. You know, a lot of times when we talk, talk about war, we don't talk about the civilians that are impacted um, and the families that are impacted and the communities and so forth. And so that was sort of the, the, um, the approach that I took. But the point of departure for me was my brother's experience. And uh, my nephew, um, who is um, only five years younger than me, um, uh, he and I had a lot of conversation. Uh, of course, he was a child when his, his father was killed. Um, and so he appreciated a lot that I was doing because I was able to um, uh, find information about Jimmy and was able to share it with him that kind of helped him feel the void in his life that he has had all this time, you know, growing up without a father and everything and the circumstances around it. Um, and so that was one of the reasons that Soul Soldiers came about was because I wanted to, um, uh, you know, do this uh, project um, that was a way to talk about the Black experience of the 1960s without directly talking about the civil rights movement. Right. And um, but there's so many close parallels between what was taking place in American society and what was taking place in the military during the Vietnam War. It's a complicated story, I know, uh, the uh, Black experience and Black experiences during the Vietnam War and Vietnam era. Uh, I was surprised at a number of um, comments that I got when we posted this event on Facebook from vets, Vietnam vets, who said, you know, why do a program like this? It just divides us. Uh, there were, you know, I didn't see color when I was in Vietnam. How would you respond to that? You know, how would you respond to that uh, that kind of a, a statement? Well, to me, to me, the Vietnam War, it doesn't matter what your race or ethnicity was. Um, I always look at it that everyone had their individual Vietnam experience. And then collectively, it was what we all experienced at the same time. And, um, you know, you know, so I'm not going to criticize anyone who says that they, they didn't see color or anything like that in Vietnam, but we do know that those were real factors. Uh, we do know that there were um, sort of, uh, you know, one of the things about America, and especially in regards to race, is that throughout our history, we've had to deal with de facto and de jure issues around race and equality and so on and so forth. And, uh, and it's just no different for the Vietnam War. Um, you know, we're still battling um, in American society in the mid 1960s with voting rights, you know, uh, with just basic human rights uh, in this country. And the military was not immune from that. So we do know, and I did know because I interviewed a number of veterans 
uh, to get their stories. I asked them questions like, um, you know, for instance, if veterans were were um, um, in country during um, the King assassination, how did that impact you? Yes. you know, and so forth. And so I was able to get individual responses to that. It was some veterans who said, you know, it really didn't impact me at all because I wasn't a follower of Dr. King. I was a follower of Malcolm X. That's a totally different dynamic. Right. You know, for a black soldier in Vietnam who's a follower of Malcolm X. Yeah. That's a totally different dynamic. So, um, but, you know, the the uh, uh, racial incidents that took place on base, the Confederate flags flown on bases in Vietnam, um, the issues that, you know, the, the sort of racial clashes that took place. I know before we came on, we were talking about... Um, some of the um, uh, racial incidents that took aboard on on the, you know, on board Kitty Hawk or the Constellation or some of the other um, aircraft carriers and carrier ships and so forth um, at bases in the Philippines, in Vietnam, in the United States. There was a major outbreak uh, at Fort Bragg, you know, and so forth. Those these were real things and real incidents, and the military did do their investigations. That's one of the things that we discuss in the Soul Soldiers book um, is, um, you know, this um, situation of racial clash and racial strife within the military. Um, and, um, and it kind of revealed something that, you know, maybe we kind of overlooked uh, toward, or, or maybe just didn't pay close attention to uh, because you even had people like <clears throat> journalists, excuse me, Wallace Terry, as late as 1967, writing in Time Magazine about um, the black the black soldier in Vietnam and what their experiences were, um, and so it, you know it wasn't like a, a secret or anything like that. Uh, it's just one of those things that I wanted to focus on instead of the blow by blow of the battles or the war. I wanted to look at it from this social aspect of what was really going on in terms of the African-American experience and uh, to what degree were the, um, you know, the civil rights uh, situation in the United States impacting what was taking place in Vietnam? Uh, you know, I've, Vietnam was the first war that was fought with a fully integrated U.S. military. Uh, the, the desegregation officially occur occurred de jour, as you point out, in 1948. But that was a slow, slow process. And you had de facto segregation, you know, well up through the early 1960s and even during the war. But the Vietnam War was the first war where, you know, all the units were, were racially integrated. And um, I think that the, the military, <laughs> the military in many cases would prefer that a soldier be a soldier, a sailor be a sailor, a Marine be a Marine. And if they couldn't wipe your past, <laughs> that would make it their job a lot easier. But unfortunately, you know, we all come from communities. We all come from families. We all come from heritages and backgrounds. And that always impacts our experiences, I think, in the military. And then it it has an impact on the military itself. And we have, I see, I'm looking in our, in our gallery here, we have uh, Carl Truss, served in the Marines uh, in, in Vietnam. Um, we have, uh, I see Chris Moore, Army. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. Uh, Vietnam veteran, I appreciate it. I, we see uh, Fred Tittle, who is a Marine. Thank you for joining us, Fred. I'm asking you to unmute if, you, if you'd care to. Robert Zimenez, thank you for joining us again. Good to see you again. Kenneth Boyd from Hawaii joining us. Kenneth, good to see you. Please. Please do feel free to to unmute yourself. And I didn't I didn't invite you guys to. Um, and if there's if there are other uh, Vietnam veterans on who also want to chime in about this, please do raise your hand. I would love to kind of just hear you know just talk generally if you'd like about your experiences during Vietnam, and um, you know how much. Your racial identity played a role in, in how you experienced it. Carl, thank you for joining us. You, Carl Truss. Carl is a, is a, is a, uh, he'd rather be behind the camera than in front of it, than in front of it. Uh, so I know this is not something you enjoy doing, but 
Thank you, Carl. How would you answer that question about how, you know, your your background, your community, where you came from, shaped your experience of war? Okay, when I when I joined the Marine Corps, I was 18 years old, and I was 18 when I went over to Vietnam. And you look at some of the 18 year olds right now, and you say, "Man, these guys are no kids." Basically, that's where I was, you know, uh, a little kid. And as far as uh, no, when I first got there, um, in my company, it was maybe about 60% um, black, Hispanic, uh, whatever. Okay. And so we didn't have a problem relating to each other when we were in Vietnam. Okay. We would go out and we would do whatever was necessary to protect our brothers. Okay. And we found out very early that that's what we were doing. We were there to help, you know, to keep, uh, well, not safe, can't say safe, but we were there to look out for each other. Okay. And so we didn't have a problem as far as uh, race was concerned. It didn't happen until we uh, went back to Okinawa and everybody just sort of went their separate ways. Okay, the, um, we had uh, a section of Okinawa called the Four Corners. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. And there, and there was PC Street where everybody else kind of went, okay? But there was never any clashes as far as, uh, um, uh, racial incidents occurring, okay? So we went there, and then we went back to Vietnam, went, went to Okinawa for retraining, went back to Vietnam, fought together, no problem. And then the problems really didn't start occurring until we got back to the United States, and we were stationed at uh, Camp Lejeune, okay? And then started having problems, uh, racial problems, and I got out of the service in 69, and you walk into, you know, this full-blown racial issues going on um, in, in, in the country. And um, uh, we had to deal with that. Yeah. Okay? Everybody dealt with it the best way that they could, all right, without getting, uh, well, getting arrested, getting hurt. Well, we were arrested a couple of times for instances, marches and things like that. But um, uh, you kind of grew up knowing that things were different, okay? And you, 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 you kind of, um, you, you worked through that, okay? Whether you were uh, staying amongst yourself or you had your, uh, gathering of friends like Mike Nemchak and right. people like that. Okay, so you stayed in, in, in that circle of friends. And when you went outside of that group, and I never, ne never traveled around the country and got involved in, in movements and things outside of, outside of Pittsburgh, but you, would, you were well aware of what was going on. Okay, and everybody would talk about what was going on. And uh, uh, you know, voice your opinions and that, lend your support wherever you could. Right. Thank you so much, Carl. Fred Tittle. Hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I um, I entered the Marine Corps sixteen uh, April of sixty nine, and was in uh, Vietnam at the beginning of nineteen seventy and spent, uh, spent one tour there with the Hotel Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marine, um, an infantry battalion that was about 25 miles outside of Da Nang in a um, place called Anwa. Our primary mission was to Secure, it was a highway that ran from Da Nang to other outposts 
And our primary mission was to secure that road to make sure that convoys could get through. Um, and along that road, there was a bridge called Liberty Bridge, and we provided security for that bridge uh, to make sure that, the, uh, that it did not get blown up. In terms of uh, racial issues in Vietnam, um, quite frankly, within our unit, we didn't have time for it. We were too busy trying to protect each other. It just was not something that we dealt with. Within the last, uh, last week, Wednesday, I received a call from Chicago, Illinois, from a Marine I served with in, in Vietnam, um, Dennis Dubisky. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, he received my contact information from another Marine that I had spoken to about three weeks prior to that. His name is um, James, um, I, I can't remember his, his last name, but he was our radio operator. He was a white guy. My squad leader was a uh, Cuban-American, um, and we just, we just lost two guys, one from Arkansas and one from Michigan. They were both white. We, we lost white Marines, we lost black Marines, and we, uh, I'm doing some, uh, beginning to do some, some research now to help us process the grief. We, we are figuring out just now that we really didn't process the grief for having lost our brothers. And for us, it does not matter whether they were black or white. These were, these were and are my brothers. You know, I have been to their homes. They have been to my home. And so we did not have racial issues in our unit in Vietnam. The racial issues came, I encountered racial issues when I came back to the States. That's when I began to encounter racial issues. But again, and I did encounter some racial issues when you when I went on R and R because once you get away from a combat area, people normally sort of go to their own groups. You saw that in Okinawa, we saw that in the Philippines, you saw that in Thailand, you saw it wherever we went. It just happened. Not only during Vietnam, but I was still in the Marine Corps doing that's a shield, that's a storm. It still occurred. And I think that it will probably continue to occur as long as we live, unless and until this generation that we're dealing with now, younger generation, I have a 17 year old granddaughter who's very multicultural. I think it's going to be up to them to really change the world. But uh, there were issues within the Marine Corps. And I'll tell you one, one other story. I served with uh, General Peterson. At the time, he was, it was in uh, 1990. Uh, it was in the 1990s. He was the highest ranking uh, African American in the Marine Corps. He was the commander of, of Quantico, Virginia Marine Base. Um, he was about ready to get out of the Marine Corps. I was at a staff NCO academy. At, uh, at Quantico, he was a three-star general. And he called all of the African-American staff NCOs together to meet with us. I thought it was pretty unusual. He wanted to meet with all of the staff NCOs, black staff NCOs. And this is what he said to us. He said, you know, things have changed in the Marine Corps tremendously. He said, but there's still issues. So you as black staff NCOs, it's going to be up to you to make sure things change. Hmm. So let me give you an, ex he said, let me give you an example. He said, I'm retiring in about 60 days. He said, normally when a Marine Corps general retires, 
about six months, three to six months before they retired, they began to get calls from various corporations asking them to sit on boards. He had less than 60 days to go. He said, I haven't received a single call. <laughs> he eventually was picked up by General Electric, Electric to sit on a board, but things changed. The, the, the military reflects the, the real world in, in most cases. Yeah. Uh, it's really up to the unit to to make sure things are equal. I retired as a first sergeant. So in my unit, there were issues, but we we simply uh -huh. nipped them in the bud. We, we let folks know that, you know, when you're here on base, every Marine is going to be treated fairly. Again, the racial issues were not for me in Vietnam. They were when I got out of Vietnam. Similar to what Carl said. Thank you so much, Fred, for joining us. And it's good to meet you. I appreciate you uh, coming on. Chris Moore. Uh, we know Chris Moore, among other things, is a uh, TV producer. He's a well-known media personality here in Pittsburgh. He's probably, well, he has to be the only person in this meeting who has an Emmy. If you have an Emmy and you're not Chris Moore, raise your hand. <laughs> I don't see any hands. Chris, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate the work that you and Sam have done to highlight our veterans' issues. Uh, on the cover of Soul Soldiers is Mike Flannoy. Uh, Mike is the one, uh, as Sam said, uh, reminds us that everybody had their own Vietnam. I saw racism in Vietnam, and maybe it was because we were in the engineers uh, and did not... Uh, uh, get involved in that much combat unless we were doing something they didn't want us to do. Um, and so uh, from the guide arms of their trucks, a lot of uh, Southern soldiers flew Confederate flags. Uh, my father told me in World War II, he was a chief petty officer, a cook. That's all they would let blacks be in the Navy then. Um, he told me that uh, um, when they were in the Pacific, uh, many of the island women would ask them to see their tails. And I said, Dad, you're kidding. Nobody asks you that. Uh, and one day we came in from stand down out the field uh, and the house girl uh, came over to me and brought me uh, my clothes she had washed. And she said, let me see your tail. Uh, and so I knew people had been telling them that the black soldiers had tails and stay away from them. I saw Confederate flags flying from the uh, guide arms of trucks. I gave uh, some Vietnamese that were working in the motor pool uh, carton of coups one day to point, paint two black fists on my bumper. And the uh, motor pool sergeant almost had a fit uh, about that. Um, but I figured if these guys could fly, fly Confederate flags, I could have two black fists on my uh, bumper. Um, I don't think I was ever called nigger or anything like that because there were too many weapons around. Um, and, and I think everybody is right. Uh, when you're in combat, nobody's thinking about that kind of stuff. But as soon as you come in for stand down, uh, mm. go back to Long Bend, which we would, use, we would do periodically, uh, you could see racism. It was there. There's, there's no doubt about it. Carol Popchock put in the chat a wonderful question that reminds me of a story that I've heard from you, Chris, before. But let me ask Carol's question right here. Was there any difference in the way the NVA or the Viet Cong treated black and white American soldiers? Do any of you have uh, any awareness of how the NVA or the Viet Cong, the enemy, might have treated soldiers? If you do have a Answer to that, let me know, raise your hand, wave your hand. Um, Chris, uh, you don't have an answer to that probably, but- No, um, I don't. You do, Vietnam was a, the Vietnam War was a racial war in a sense, in that there was, you know, the, the, the in war, the enemy is often racialized as a way to dehumanize the enemy. Um, 
You have a story about being an American soldier in Vietnam yeah. and, and having that attitude toward the enemy. Well, uh, except for a piece of armor, we were the biggest thing on the road. Uh, we drove five and 10 ton vehicles, and sometimes we pulled Rome plows and, and other heavy equipment like that. Uh, and these are small, as everybody knows, where they were paved, uh, two lane roads. And uh, once we would get so far, we would drop that escort uh, that was provided and we just run the long bin. Uh, and one day I was coming uh, off the road and I was pulling another five ton that had 10 tons of gravel on it. My friend Bear from Chicago, Roosevelt Dyes, was, had broken down, so I was pulling him in. I came over this hill and there was a bus uh, going to Dak Tao uh, and everybody seen these short buses. It'd be about 10 Vietnamese young men hanging on the back bumper. The things would be loaded on the top, they'd be packed. Uh, and I decided to pass him and I moved over in, in the other lane and started hurtling downhill toward this Lambretta. Well, the Lambretta stopped in his lane and he would not yield a road. We used to, I think about this all the time. Um, we used, we used to, the things we used to do, we used to run them off the road, run them in the ditch and all that sort of stuff. Well, this guy decided that day he wasn't having it. He stopped in his lane. I geared the truck down, slammed the brakes on, skidded to a stop and I looked down at him and I was cussing him and I said, you stupid gook. And he was cussing me right back. I tell you, he hated me. He made me back that double truck up and go around him. Uh, and something came over me and I said, I'm in this man's country, in the wrong, in the lane, about to run him off the road or kill him, make a grease spot out of him, which these two trucks would have done. And I'm calling him a name. And when we got back to base, uh, people would say, and everybody knows this, they would say, ain't nothing but a gook, man. And uh, uh, it something just came over me, and I started correcting black and white soldiers, saying, "Hey, man, that same same you called me nigga in the world. That same same you called me." That. And they go, "What? What were you talking about?" I said, "No." And it wasn't until uh, years later when Mike Flournoy told me, uh, and other people told me um, that they're glad that realization came over me because what we did was dehumanize the Vietnamese. It made them easy to kill if it wasn't nothing but a gook. I don't care if it was an auto accident or shooting one. Uh, and to me, that was same, same being called nigga in the world. And I would stop everybody who said the word gook and tell them that. And they get, some of them would get mad, some of them would shake their head, some of them wouldn't understand it. Uh, but that was the experience that made me realize that we were all human beings and you are not try to force your will on somebody because you were better equipped, had a bigger truck or anything like that. Sam Black. Yeah, I, I don't have any personal experiences, of course, um, in Vietnam with this, uh, but I do want to remind that um, in this whole aspect of NVA or Viet Cong treating black soldiers differently, um, one of the things to remember is in the early 1920s, um, Ho Chi Minh lived in New York City. Ho Chi Minh used to frequent in Harlem and used to attend some of the African history classes that were being taught by Marcus Garvey. Um, so he had a, a familiarity with African-Americans and uh, with their plight in this country. Um, it is true, and I learned this from veterans. As a matter of fact, in our Soul Soldiers exhibit, we had one of the leaflets that the uh, Viet Cong was using to kind of exploit the racial strife that was taking place in America. You know, those are all, you know, it was a tactic uh, used during the Vietnam War. And, um, uh, and so those types of things did happen. Uh, the other thing was a comment. I remember um, a uh, uh, Tanzanian historian, Muhammad Babu once said that um, in this whole thing of the Cold War, mm -hmm. 
uh, that America fought communism in third world countries. And that does something to your psyche when you think about that, because those countries are, are black, brown, and yellow people, uh, if I could use those terms. Um, and that is something that is in, imprinted into our um, uh, military mentality. And that is sort of what Chris is talking about uh, here is, you know, it even happened in World War I. We, you know, when the term Hun was being used so much against the Germans, it was a derogatory term, uh, but it was to dif differentiate and to treat the enemy um, as the worst thing on earth. You know, mm -hmm. it, it helps develop that mentality to win the war. You know, and so the same thing took place there. But in Vietnam, yes, the, the Viet Cong and the NVA really did try to exploit um, the, um, you know, the civil rights strife in the, in the movement in the United States uh, and use that, tried to use that as a strategy and a tactic to um, uh, impact the mentality of Black soldiers. You could go online to a bunch of different historical sites, museum sites, and find leaflets like this one. Afro-Americans, these are disseminated by the National Liberation Front or the Viet Cong. The NVA also had their versions uh, in combat. You are In Vietnam, you are forced to go first, withdraw last, and the outer ring, and you go down. It's, 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 it's appealing especially to Black soldiers, refuse to obey combat orders, sit on the fence, refuse to interfere. And then on the end, it says, you know, join us, <laughs> join the South Vietnamese National Liberation Front. You'll be warmly welcomed and you'll receive all possible help in return to the United States or seek asylum in a foreign country. So this was this was quite common. I've heard Fred Tittle. Yeah, I just want to uh, say, say a couple of things about dehumanization. Um, in Vietnam that I dealt with. Um, I have not actively sought out any of the folks that I served with. All of the people that I am in contact with, they sought me out to speak with, to speak to me. And I think one of the reasons um, I was a bit older than most of the Marines that I served with. Um, and we lost a lot of people. And so one of the things that would happen within our unit, if we had lost a couple of buddies, on a patrol or ambush or whatever we went on, normally when we went out again, after having lost people, there was a tendency that the Marines would become very violent toward the civilians because we were, uh, you know, going through villages, I'm doing some writings. I have some writings that I've completed in seminary. I talked about us as Marines being very similar to Terrius. Terrius as it related to the civilian population. A, a couple of things happen. when we went out after we had lost some people. And I encountered one of the Marines getting ready to rape a girl. He was going into the hooch and he was taking his slack down. And I blocked his path. And I, he said, what are you doing, Tittle? I said, 
listen. I said, I know what you're getting ready to do. And I said, over my dead body, will this happen? One of the other guys who contacted me was the Marine that I just mentioned earlier, his name Sneakers. He stood up at the door with me to block the door so that this Marine would not enter the door. The Marine that we stopped from entering the door, that's the Marine who called me last week. Mm -hmm. And so some of the Marines, the Marines that have contacted me, they are hurting from a lot of the trauma. Yes that they experience. That's the reason I'm trying to get to put together a research group for my unit, because, because I know it's not just my unit that's dealing with this. Yes. These guys, we are, you know, we are dying and they're trying to get their life together before they die, but there's so much stuff that they witness and that they saw, that we saw, not just them, but I saw the same thing but I processed it a little differently because, because of my parents. My parents and the upbringing that I had as a growing up in rural segregated Arkansas. My parents taught me to treat everyone like I wanted to be treated. And so I maintain that even 20 some years in the Marine Corps, I value every life and that's the reason i became a chaplain because i value every life even now that's what i do i bury soldiers and veterans it, it doesn't matter what color they are it doesn't matter what color they are they they are my brothers and sisters so again dehumanization is a part of the process of war but many of our men and women coming back they are suffering because they did things, we did things that we knew we should not have done, but we were so caught up into and angry after having lost someone. So we're taking it out on whoever is in front of us. So dehumanization is, is, a, is something that um, has caused a lot of difficulty, not only in Vietnam, but everywhere we went. That's part of the process to you dehumanize people because it makes it easier to kill them. They're not human. Fred, we are so lucky to have you here kind of sharing your perspective and your comrades are lucky to have you. It, I can just picture it. They, they still look up to you. You know, that you're still the leader. I'm looking in our chat here. Wonderful, wonderful comments. Um, uh, Michael Horton, absolutely. Sue Watson and I were talking about moral injury the other day, which I think is what you're talking about, Fred, in part. Pat Hughes, wonderful story here in the chat. Fascinating. Larry, let me ask Kenneth Boyd. Kenneth, you've been waiting patiently all the way in Hawaii. And uh, you were Army, combat veteran, as we could see from your hat, Purple Heart, as we could see from your hat. What was your experience race in the Vietnam? Uh, let me tell you my whole story. Um, I was living, before I, I went to Vietnam, I was living in San Bernardino, California. I was going to uh, San Bernardino Valley College. I was a surfer and uh, a springboard diver. I got a full scholarship offer to University of Alabama, which my parents told me I shouldn't go because they'd probably kill me if I went down there. And um, so uh, I went into the military and I, my attitude was just to do the best that I could, whatever it was I was doing. So I maxed out everything, the PT and all that stuff and went to AIT. They offered me to be a mechanic, uh, uh, actually an aircraft mechanic. And um, so I went there and I got distinguished graduate in the first school. I got distinguished graduate in the second school and then off to Vietnam. 
when I landed in Cameron Bay, they got on a bus and headed to my unit, which was uh, Delta Company 229th Aviation Battalion, the first calf. Riding on the bus, I was looking at these uh, houses as you know along the road, and I saw young black kids with afros. I mean, you know, like two and three years old, and I we've been here too long. You know, they, they shouldn't be there. And so I got to my unit, and um, the thing in my unit, we 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 didn't uh, we weren't in the jungles crawling around and shit like you know the guys who I really admired because they had, they're the brave guys. We, we, my company was a gun company and uh, we flew support. And um, I, after I got my first helicopter, um, after a month or so, you know, get trained before that, you know what you're doing. Um, started going on missions and I, I enjoyed it. When I first went over there, I thought, I'm gonna kill me some comics when I get there. But after I was there a little bit, I thought, I don't think so. These people, these are just like me, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, later on, they switched from uh, Bravo and Charlie Model Hueys to Cobras, and they sent me to school in Vung Tao. And um, I, I got my choice of the first Cobras that came in country. And so I chose a hog, which has uh, 76 rockets and, um, and a minigun and a turret. And I, I, like I said, I had the attitude to do the best I could. So my ship was super clean. The pilots love flying it. Um, let me go back a little bit. When, when we made a move, our unit, we would uh, fly the helicopters and then we sandbag around them. So if they mortared us, the helicopters wouldn't get too damaged. We go to Chow in a tent, uh, what they call the GP medium tent. Uh, the blacks sit with the blacks, the whites sit with the whites and the officers sit separate, okay? Uh, I didn't identify that way. I, since I was a surfer, I had surfer friends, which were white. And I ended up uh, hanging out with a group, a small group that was, uh, Three whites, an Indian from, uh, uh, you know, an American Indian we call chief. And um, that's about it. And, and so we hung out together and, and kind of separate from the rest. And um, going back to this helicopter I got, uh, the, the officers, you know, I got the, the prejudice vibe from the officers and stuff, except there was a, a, a warrant officer that, that came in that um, he was white and, and, and very cool. He had this huge handlebar mustache and was totally not prejudiced. You know, we're like buddies. He was, uh, I think he was a couple years older than me. And uh, one night they woke me up uh, uh, about two o'clock in the morning and say, boy, get your chip ready to go on a mission. And before that, uh, my ship had a problem where it uh, had an attitude indicator that was defective. So I, I circled red X, it meaning it couldn't fly at night. And I said, I'm not gonna do that because uh, that ship's not allowed to fly at night. And so they said, you better do it. We're gonna threaten you, you know, article 15 or whatever. They did, I go, forget you guys, I'm not gonna do it. And so they took the ship up anyway. Woke up the next morning, I go, where's my ship? And uh, they, some of the, I don't know who told me this, but they said uh, they flew it into the ground. And uh, that was um, uh, that Wallace, uh, uh, Warren mm -hmm. Office Wallace and Shay. And so they they were both dead, you know. So that 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 got me a little bit, you know. But um, I I my mother had sent me a, a model of the Cobra, and and uh, I had had like a little uh, some kind of ceremony where I, I it was a plastic reveal model and we set the model on fire and, and uh, to protest that, you know, and then. Uh, and I, I wanted, I'm just interrupting Kenneth to say, I believe this is the Cobra hog, the kind of 
helicopter you're talking about. No, that's not a hog. Oh. The, the, <laughs> uh, the hog had a, that large um, uh, rocket where you're pointing right now. The hog had two of those on each side. Oh, each okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, where was I? Uh, I'm sorry. You had a model cobra that you set on fire as ceremony. Yeah, and and we had a little ceremony there. That was my way of protesting it. Uh, um, once we we went on this, uh, like in a took a deuce and a half to get sandbags. And what we would do is we pay the Vietnamese uh, uh, a penny a bag to fill a sandbag, and uh, there'd be like. Um, women and some children and old men. And there was this uh, white guy that was from the South, you know, this, I would call him a redneck. And he was on the truck just yelling at them and do this and do that, like he's a slave master or something. And so I got on his case, I told him, you know, I'm gonna beat your butt if you don't quit it. And instantly, I got respect from all the workers that were there. I mean, it was, you could just feel the, the instant, you know, and, um, and that's just one instance. Um, I, I, um, something that, that bothers me, like I was, I was a, a troubleshooter. I, I, if, if some other crew chief couldn't fix this helicopter, I would help him out or I'd fix it for him. And um, they, they were sending the crew chiefs to Da Nang to uh, support special forces. And, and they would live there with special forces, but they wouldn't send me. And I was going, how come they're not sending me? You know, I'm the best crew chief here. And so it, towards the end of my tour, they finally sent me there. And, and that, that's where I had, I think, the most fun of, of being in Vietnam because since I was a surfer, I, I met this uh, one Green Beret. They kind of assigned him to me to show me like the weapons and how, what to do and all that kind of stuff. And uh, one of the things he asked me is, uh, do you know where we can get some pot or some weed? And I, I had, uh, I, I didn't smoke then. I, I was a drinker then. And, um, but I had gone with some guys in, into Da Nang and, and with them when they went to smoke pot. And so I knew where the place was. I go, yeah, I know. So come with me and I'll show you. And so his payment to me was he came with a deuce and a half. He goes, let's go get you a surfboard. And so we went to uh, the r r Center in Da Nang and stole a surfboard. And <laughs> on the um, where we were stationed in Da Nang was right on the beach. And um, these, we were like from coming from tents, you know, which was all that I was there, tents, solid tents. We had uh, actual houses we were living in. You, need, there, you know, they were, uh, had tin roofs that the engineers built. And my house was right on the beach. I could just come out the door and run to the water across the sand. And uh, what bothers me now, which I'm not sure of since, you know, I, I was friendly with all the, they had like um, uh, waitresses in a, in a chow hall, hall. You go in the chow hall and, and they would come and say, what would you like to eat for breakfast? And you could say whatever, steak and eggs or anything you want and they'd fix it for you. And then we had hooch maids that would come and, and pick up our uh, dirty clothes from the day before and make our beds. And we come back in the afternoon and the laundry folded on the bed and ready to go for the next day. And I treated all them with respect, you know, because I knew where they were coming from, you know. And and so I would be sitting out there in the in the water and they, they had a marine uh, range, a rifle range or whatever. And I'd be sitting out there and the ricochets would be landing around me while I was sitting out there. But I was too into surfing to worry about that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, uh, I, uh, I, uh, the, I was coming, I was a specialist fourth class and, and uh, I was coming up for uh, spec five and I, I happened to be out surfing and, and they came in a helicopter and started 
circling around. Come on, boys, you got to go to the board to get your spec five. I'm going to go, no, I don't care about that. I just want to stay out here and serve. <laughs> and so they, they went and left me out there. And then later we had this, uh, this is still at the special forces camp. We had this um, new officer come. He, he'd only been there like a couple weeks or something like that. And uh, I had went diving and I caught a sea snake and the sea snakes are all poisonous. And uh, I was showing it to one of the, uh, one of my, uh, like another specialist. And he went, took the snake and it was in like a Ziploc bag type thing. And he went around to the back where the officers were and I could hear him talking. That snake's poisonous. You better get rid of that snake. And so uh, Newsom, this was his name. He comes running back over there. He goes, they're gonna kill your snake. You better take it. And so here comes this officer. He didn't know where, you know, like new in country. He goes, boy, you better kill that snake. And I go, I'm not killing this snake. He goes, I'm giving you a direct order. You kill that snake. I go, I'm not killing this snake. So I took the snake and put him back in the ocean. Or, and so uh, that caused me to, uh, uh, they, they sent me back out into the field. Uh, the field, when I say the field, is to our camps in the tent. It's nothing like right. running you know, crawling around and stuff. And uh, the, luckily my commander, uh, he was cool. He, he, he goes, uh, asked me what happened. And I told him, he goes, I can understand that. He said, but I got to do something because um, uh, I got to show the officers that, you know, they got some power. Right. And so he said, I'm going to, I'm going to give you uh, take a month's pay and um, you'll be confined to the base and you're going to have an Article 15. But after I got out of uh, Vietnam, it, none of that was on the record. He didn't do that at all, which was very cool. But I did have to stay on the, on the base. Oh, and, man. Kenneth, what? Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I just I, I wanted to I wanted to let people know that um, before we go on, because Robert Zimenez, I know I want him to share a story or two. Uh, but I want to let people know and invite everybody. If you haven't been to one of our events before, come next week, next Monday night. We do this every Monday night at seven. We're going to have the author of this book, Black Dragon, which is about one Marine company that fought in Roy Namor, Saipan, Tinian, and Iwo Jima in World War II. And uh, we're going to tr track, it's kind of like the Band of Brothers of Iwo Jima. We're going to track that the history of this company this will be uh, next Monday, Glenn Flickinger, host of Greatest Generation Live, will be the host of this program next Monday night. We're also doing Vietnam Veterans Day again. And of course, March 29th, an important day on our calendar here with the Veterans Breakfast Club. We're doing an event at Heinz History Center that is also going to be streamed. And we are inviting and especially wanting anybody who served during the Vietnam era, doesn't matter where you served in country or not, it uh, doesn't matter when, from 1955 to 1975, we would like to honor you and recognize you and, and kind of celebrate you and hear your story. So please join us in person or online every, and we want you to uh, join us, especially because every, we want to send you a welcome home gift bag. When you men and women came home from Vietnam, you didn't get a lot of pats on the back or your, you know, thank you for your service. Uh, so we thought we would uh, put together welcome home gift bags and send them out to every veteran who registers for this event. I'll put the registration link here in the chat. We have a magazine that goes out every quarter, VBC Magazine. This is our latest issue. If you don't get it, let me know, and I'll be happy to put one in the mail to you. We send this out free of charge to anybody who wants it. Just email me, Todd, T-O-D-D, -D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org. And we also have a survey, three-question survey. It takes two and a half minutes to, to fill out. It's just, you know, what do you think of this program? Would you like or not like about it? And how can we improve? Uh, please do fill that out if we can. Again, I'll put that in the chat. Um, Kenneth, I'm going to go to to Robert Zimenez just because I want to make sure that he he uh, gets a chance to share a little bit of his story. Uh, and then I want to open it up a little bit. Robert, thank you for joining us. Uh, good evening, Todd. And good evening to uh, all my fellow vets and everyone on the program this evening. Um, First of all, disclaimer, I never served in Vietnam, but I'm a Vietnam era vet. Um, and I think the reason why Todd invited me on is because I was on another one of his programs where I was, I guess, highlighted as an individual who could speak to 
some issues around prejudice in the military. Um, and ironically, my story is no different than what I've heard this evening. I mean, there's some giants in this room. I mean, I'm listening to some of these people, some of the credentials you have and some of the experiences that you have. And I'm sitting back here all kind of hoping Todd wasn't going to call on me. Because <laughs> I, I don't really know if I could hold a candle to you. I Think mean, how I feel, Robert. I'm listening to Chris. I'm listening to <laughs> Sam, Samuel, excuse me, Fred Little. It's like, man. And then Kenneth Boy, you just blew me away. It's like I, I was imagining when I was overseas that same experience. So let me just back it up a little bit. Um, I'm the individual, and somebody made a reference about Martin Luther King versus a Malcolm X. Now I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I hear I got my Pittsburgh fan up in there somewhere. I heard somebody from Pittsburgh. That's you, Fred. Somebody from Pittsburgh. Okay, Chris, I got you. And at the time when I came in, I was a hothead. I was a renegade. I, I literally was running from Philadelphia. I needed a job. And they were going to send me to jail. So I joined the service. And in no disrespect, at the time, and I'd said this before and Todd knows, it wasn't about God and country. It wasn't about any of that. It was pure survival. Once I got into the service, I felt the same thing I've heard echoed throughout this whole broadcast. White, Black, Asian, Puerto Rican, Latino, now we say it didn't matter who you were. We were a band of brothers. And although there was prejudice, and, and, and I like the fact that as long as we were together, we were fine. When we separated is when we saw prejudice. I would go with my brothers. The white brothers would go with their brothers. The Latinos would hold up together. And of course, no disrespect to all my officers that might be on this thing. Y'all didn't even speak to us. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that goes without saying. You know, we we couldn't. Now, now I, I will take, now let me, let me take that back because at one point, I did graduate and I became the general's orderly. So I, I was a little different at times. By that time, I had changed my tune. I had uh, gone from being that individual who thought that everybody was uh, out to get me. I wasn't as angry. Uh, I found a purpose. Um, I, I belong to 16 Field Service Company. We live nine months out of the year in the field. So I knew about all of that. We were a support unit. So we supported everybody. We did everything. But then at one point they opened it up and they let me join the honor guard. Now they're going to let this crazy boy from Philadelphia join the honor guard. And I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> I shined. For some reason, the light bulbs went on and I started to really look into this service thing and say, you know what? You know, God must have had a plan for me because it kind of, it turned me around. Again, there was prejudice, but where I saw it the most is when we weren't together and we got into our own little groups and our own little cliques. Then I guess we were looked upon as who we were. If you were white, then you were the white boys. If you were black, you were whatever they called us at the time. <laughs> Latinos, Sometimes we mix together with black. Sometimes they mix together with white. It didn't make any difference. So, you know, come back to work the next morning. We all on the same mission. We all doing the same thing together. So as, 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 as I started to grow and once I got back home, I started seeing it. I think somebody else mentioned the fact there really wasn't no love loss. I mean, when you come back home, it's like, uh, they, we didn't really get any respect. Now, nah, I'm going to tell you the truth. Not really. It wasn't like it is now. Thank you for your service. We're glad that you served. I don't remember any of that. Mm -hmm. Only thing it was good for was I had a VA benefit. I could possibly go to school. I could probably buy me a house. And other than that, nobody really cared who I was. I mean, I was lost, you know, but at the time, we started utilizing some of the VA services and the things of that nature. And anybody that's on this thing, once you know, when you walk into the VA, it seems like you back where you know that's familiar and you enjoy it 
even if it looks bad. Mm-hmm. Even those guys that are suffering, you want to go over to them and you all right, man, can I help you? Do you need anything? You know. One more thing, Todd, I'm going to go ahead and let somebody else talk because I'm enjoying this. What I have done since then is I've become a member of a military fraternity. And that's where Todd first grabbed me because a friend of ours who's our media director for my fraternity is very good friends with Todd. Uh, we call him Hush. And I'm a member of Mubeta 5 Military Fraternity Incorporated. And I'm going to tell you, that's the best thing I've ever seen. We're a group of veterans from every branch of the service. It doesn't matter where you are, what color you are, where you serve, what you've done. We are brothers and we support one another. We help everybody, educational benefits, housing benefits, uh, those that are going through PTSD, uh, physical ailments, whatever it is. We come together on the one common thread that we are all brothers in arms. And that's where we go. It's so it's so it's so funny. And I'm end with this. My wife and a couple of my line brothers wives who did not believe and I belong to a lot of organizations. They don't believe in any of that nonsense. When they saw what we were doing as a military fraternity, our wives joined what they call the military spousal sorority. And it's like. All of our families together, each one, teach one, helping one another. So programs like this, and every time I get an opportunity to talk to a vet, work with a vet, or hear some of these stories, I'm all for it. And I'm again, and I'm going to end with this. You gentlemen, no disrespect to the ladies, but I've only heard the guys tonight. Some of you guys that have spoke today, y'all are my heroes because I'm that Malcolm X. Malcolm X was my hero. I love Martin Luther King, but Malcolm X was who I was. But listening to you guys right here, we got a chaplain that was in country. We got a, a, a Emmy Award winning person. Lord have mercy. You know what I mean? Uh, Carl, I remember Carl from before on another program. It's like, you know, I'm like, I'm home. And it's like, I'm glad to see that programs like this continue to exist and that we get to share our stories. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate you, man. Robert, I feel like I'm in the company of giants of greatness every time I do a program, and I really mean that. I'm I'm 57 years old. The Vietnam veterans generation, you men and women, you're all my older brothers and sisters. That's how I I will always look up to you. I will always like see you as my, I don't know, an older brother or sister. I think that's why this this conversation means so much to me. Renee, you're an older sister. I, I mean, Thank younger you. sister, probably younger sister. I but don't you, think so. Renee was Renee Johnson was a donut dolly in country in Vietnam. Thank you for joining us, Renee. Thank you. Um, my first year in Vietnam, I served with two infantry units, AmeriCal and 25th Infantry Division. And I saw the closeness, the brotherhood of people, regardless of color, you know, when they were out in the field, uh, yeah, especially in the combat arms, but overall. But my second year, in my second assignment at Camp Baxter, Da Nang, I had kind of a rude awakening. A lot of the guys at Camp Baxter were part of McNamara's 100,000 program. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but it's where they brought young men in from uh, basically the hoods in Southern California and other places the theory was they would give them training so they could get decent jobs when they left because they were high school dropouts, they were hoodlums, you know, gang members, etc. It didn't work out as planned. But when I was at Camp Baxter in early 71, we had race riots on Camp Baxter. It's very hard to find when you Google anything about that. And one of the things I found was that it was blacks versus whites, when in fact, it was mainly blacks versus what was it, or then called Chicanos. These guys were stevedores. They were laborers. They had, they weren't trying to save their own lives most of the time. They had a lot of time to think and think about their grudges against the army and how poorly they were treated. And they really stayed separated. And it was a very scary thing when you're in the mess hall and bullets are flying through the 
uh, screens because the blacks were over here and the whites were over there. Fortunately, I subsequently went to an aviation base further south. And again, I saw that closeness, that brotherhood. But things did happen in Vietnam that were very unusual and it didn't really show a brotherhood all the time. I hope that now, as time has passed, those feelings have gone, but it was a little scary. And I'd like to address something that Samuel said when he was talking about how families were affected when their loved ones didn't come home. I'm going to post this now. There's a book out by a Vietnam vet called Jack McCabe. It's called Those We Left Behind. And it talks about the families and how they were affected by the loss of their loved ones in Vietnam. And it's a very interesting book. I think you can get it on Amazon, probably Barnes and Noble, but I just wanted to throw that out there if anybody's interested in it. Thank you, Renee. Please do put that in the chat. Joe Griffies, I know that you've been uh, champing at the bit here. How are I you know. doing this evening? Not bad. Uh, great subject. I didn't ever think. I would ever hear this subject spoken about back in America. You know, we say every week on our show, it's a shame we couldn't bottle the camaraderie that we had in Vietnam and bring mm -hmm. it back home here to the world. Now, there may be a little of it. I was in Vietnam 67, 68. I'm sorry to say, I did not see it. You know, we had the same mentality. We're all from the same neighborhood. Just what... Uh, Renee said, or Rini, excuse me, said a few minutes ago, we also emptied our prisons out. You went in front of a judge and the judge said, go in the army, you're going to jail. And let me tell you something. We have a guy in Philadelphia that got caught stealing hubcaps, a black guy, Laura Blevitt. He's under consideration to be elevated to the Medal of Honor. He should get two. He was a black kid going to jail at 18 years old and saved a whole bunch of white guys. Let me tell you something. God. I mean, Fred, Kenneth, they took me right back to my buddies in Vietnam. You know, a, a mortar round, an AK-47, mm -hmm. a hand grenade did not have a name on it, didn't have a date on it, didn't have a color, it didn't care if you were black, white, blue, green, yellow, Indian, Asian, white. It didn't care if you were an athlete, atheist, a Jew, a Catholic, your buddy. And guess what? If your buddies got hit that week in you, you had one less guy. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't see people today put their hands in the gut of a a black guy put his hands in the gut of a, a, a bleeding white guy or vice versa or anything. We didn't look for gloves. We just looked. How could we stop the blood? And I'll tell you what. If there was any prejudice, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. And let me tell you something. If I could just take another minute, I fight the VA a lot. I do I do a veterans welcome home show. And as Todd knows, I battle the VA a lot. My battle today was that the secretary and a whole bunch of his people went out to visit a homeless veteran in Washington. I guess it was a couple of weeks ago. I just got I just got it posted today. And it was a black veteran, Vietnam veteran, sitting on a box next to a dumpster. I felt like it was my brother. They went, they gave him socks and a hat and a certificate to fill out in the rain for his benefits. And then they gave him a $20 gift card. Now, if you've ever been to Washington, you can't buy a damn thing in Washington for $20. Why didn't they put him in that limousine and take him to a hotel? And when I'm done tonight, I'll be emailing all night long. That was an injustice. That was a black guy. I, that guy didn't take me to the dumpster that took me back to Vietnam. And when we look back in the world here now and we see the freedom the weekend is only worth a $20 gift card from the secretary of the VA, something's wrong. Now, I don't care if that guy sitting on that box next to the dumpster. They got in their $200,000 taxpayer limousines. Why didn't they take him to a hotel that night? They left him in the rain. Mm -hmm. I went to get my car, drive to Washington and find him, bring him to my house. One thing veterans still have today is, regardless of the color of the veteran, male or female, takes his 
we can I, I can identify with Fred and, and Keith tonight with 50 guys. They look like them, they act like them, they talk like them, they have this the same instinct. And 99.9% .9 of the time, I did not see it. I only wish we had a statistic. And I'll end with this. If we knew how many black guys jumped on a hand grenade or how many to save a white guy or how many white guys jumped on a hand grenade to save a, a black guy or, or an Asian or an American Indian, we don't know that fact. But the prejudice did happen when we came home because an awful lot of African-American, an awful lot of Hispanics, an awful lot of Native American Indians and an awful lot of Jews did not get the Medal of Honor they deserved. And I want to let everybody on this board know, you can only promote a medal to the Medal of Honor with new evidence. Prejudice is now accepted at the Pentagon as new evidence. And let me tell you something, I can name five African-Americans I was with. Damn it, they should have got something higher than the Medal of Honor. So I want to thank everybody, but, and I didn't mean to get on a tangent, but Fred and, and, and Kenneth, you, you gave me some good thoughts for dreaming tonight. Thank oh. you, that's all. Yeah, thank you, Joe. You know, we have uh, just a few minutes left in the program, and we always run out of time. There are too many stories here in the room. Russ McBride, I know that you have something uh, to share. Do you care to in a, just a few minutes? Oh, I can't hear you. Russ, I can't hear you. Let me see. It looks like your, is your, no, your microphone isn't working. I wonder if you sometimes it's uh, if you if you're in full screen mode, sometimes that causes a problem. Oh. Larry Holman, you also have made some wonderful comments here in the chat. Uh, please do feel free to to say more. And if anybody else wants to raise their hand or have some, you know, a few comments to end with. Oh, here we go, Carl. How are you? There we go. Um, I just wanted to uh, say a little bit about something about what Fred was talking about, that Marine that has reached out to him. Yes. Okay. Back when I came back from Vietnam, okay, they didn't have a name for PTSD. They told us to go out, have a couple beers, blow off steam, be in formation at 0700 Monday morning. Okay. And so what... I'm, I'm 70, I'll be 75 years old. And it wasn't until maybe about, what, 15 years ago that they came up with this name for, for PTSD. And they say, okay, it's from the whores of the war. The whores of the war was not going out and fighting the enemy. Okay, that was our job. We did that to protect ourselves and everybody else. The whores were pulling back those men and women who had been wounded, who had been killed and mutilated. Okay, that, what, that is one of the main causes of PTSD. And that is one of the things that Fred, that person may be reaching out to you for help. And I hope that you, that you uh, give this man some help. Okay, I've referred people to, to Todd in the Breakfast Club, to the VA. Um, people have called me and I've, I've, I've walked them through the process of getting help. But these folks need help. Robert, I'm going to refer people to you, to your organization, okay, because they need help, okay? And like I said, the horrors are not going out and doing your job, going out and fighting the enemies. It's that guy next to you getting blown away. Those kind of images are what hunts, hunts a lot of the uh, combat servicemen today. And... Uh, yeah, Vietnam was what, some 50 some odd years ago? Okay, and you have guys now that are still seeking help. That's how deep rooted this stuff is. Absolutely. Okay, but there is help for it. There's help for it. Okay, there's counseling, there's friendships, there's help for it. And hopefully, when people read, when you hear of people suffering or having, struggling with that, that you will help them. Boo Beta Phi is a wonderful organization. I do want to add, here's what we'll do. Uh, if you want to get in touch with Boo Beta Phi and Robert or anybody on this program, email me. I'll put you in touch with them. I'm Todd, T-O-D-D -D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org. 
Charles Person, you uh, you joined us uh, later here in the program. Were you a Vietnam veteran? Uh, yes, I am. When did you serve? I was the second group of Marines to go into Vietnam in 1965. So did you, the second group, the first group went what, March 8th, 1965? Yeah, they were, they went to Da Nang and for the north. And you, when did you land? I, it was in uh, May of 65. May of 65, early on, boy, oh boy. Very brutal. Another Marine. Um, and are you friends with Scott Masters? Are you you uh, were you with Scott's class? Did you speak to the class? Yes, yeah, I spoke to his class. I'm a I'm a, a freedom rider, and uh, what happened is that um, after we were attacked and beaten, um, and we went to trial, and the men were exonerated, my mother uh, encouraged me to join the army because she figured it was safer in the army than staying in the civil rights movement. Holy so, mackerel, uh, Charles. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You were in the Freedom Ride that was attacked in Jackson, Mississippi. No, in, Bar in Anderson, Alabama. In, in Anderson, in Alabama. Birmingham. Holy mackerel. I need your contact information. I'm going to make Scott give me your contact information. We, uh, th What a... But why did you join the Marine Corps? You could have joined the Army. Well, <laughs> uh, well, I checked them out, and I think psychologically the miracle was better for me. That training, you know, I was in good physical shape anyway, but uh, I wanted a challenge, and my dad was a good soldier. And in fact, I have a family was a really a militaristic family, I guess you'd say. I had an uncle who ran away to fight with Teddy Roosevelt, and he was killed uh, in Cuba. Uh, but as all the men in my family have served honorably, and I guess, uh, you know, that's, that's just a family thing. You had an uncle who was a rough rider with yes. Teddy Roosevelt? Yes. Who died in Cuba? Yes. Mm. Holy mackerel. You're like military royalty here, Charles. <laughs> Absolutely. Man. Wow. My, is dad that was a, my dad was a very proud soldier. I mean, you really, he was spitting polish in the end. And the sad thing about it, you know, I, well, um, he never got the benefit of the GI Bill until I uh, returned from Vietnam. But, uh, you know, they didn't allow blacks in the South to have uh, some portion of the GI Bill. So he basically lived in a in squalor for years and years and years. Yeah, yeah that's me. That's you. Oh my goodness. Hmm. What we have such interesting people here on this program tonight. I would love to talk to you again, Charles. I'd love to hear more of your story and also you know, on the Freedom Rides, obviously, uh, but also in the Marine Corps. Um, I, but let's see here. I just want to show people this good looking Marine here. Hold on. Here we go. I'm going to ask you a very stupid question, Charles. You probably you don't know me, so you don't know how stupid I could be. Did you like the Marine Corps? I loved it. I learned a lot, but uh, I think the Freedom Riders prepared me, saved my life because the things I learned as a Freedom Rider protected me in Vietnam. How? Explain that. Well, uh, you know, we used to pray as, as Freedom Riders, Lord, do not let me be afraid. Well, likewise in combat. You ask the Lord not to let you be afraid because if you're afraid, you can't do your job. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I there are times I should have been afraid and I wasn't. And I really attribute that to being a freedom rider. I'm sure Scott Masters, thank you so much for for funneling these photos to me. This is so, so Interesting. I'm I'm extending the program a little bit longer, Charles, just because you joined us. That's me in the middle of that. This is an iconic photo. I, I've seen this photo before. I, I never imagined I'd meet the person who was in the middle of it. They were all exonerated. This photo, the FBI uh, uh, arrested them and they brought them to trial. And uh, they went for two weeks and they decided that they were innocent. But uh, 
Where was this? That was in Birmingham. That's the only image that, it's, that we have so far from Birmingham. I know there have to be other images, but for some reason, they haven't surfaced. Oh, my. And your mother implored you to join the military because it would be safer than the civil rights movement. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you care to just give us a little bit of a history lesson about the Freedom Rise? This was an attempt to desegregate interstate transit. Well, right. the Freedom Rise was not an act of civil disobedience. It was a test, simply a test to see which states would comply with the Supreme Court ruling that said that blacks can sit and uh, at any anywhere on the bus and when they and the terminals that so they could eat in a restaurant or using the other facilities. Uh, there were two laws that had been passed by the Supreme Court, one in 1947 and one in 1960. Uh, but, uh, you know, still there were people who refused to treat us. And we paid full fare. It's not like we were getting discounts or anything like that. And they were not chartered buses. But even a lot of blacks would, where they did take the signs down, continue to go to the uh, segregated facilities, being fed through a cubby hole like you would feed an animal. Well, you didn't say you were a paying passenger. So that was what we were testing. And so these rides would go from the northern part of the South to the deep South. And, and it was a test to see if Southern states were complying with federal transit regulations yeah. saying that they, you know, uh, interstate transit was desegregated. You were among those who were then arrested in, I think it was Jackson. Yeah, there there were many arrested. You know, there were in the end there were 436 freedom riders, and ironically, 50 percent was white and 50 percent was black, and one fourth were women. And the only people that were planned was the first group and the second group. Uh, but a lot of people paid a tremendous price because my partner ended up receiving 53 stitches that day, and the oldest freedom rider on our ride spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair for the beating he received that day. So. Oh. Who was your partner? Uh, James Peck. James Peck. Um, and you spent, you were in jail. They no, I didn't go arrested. to jail. No, I didn't go to jail. I was, uh, after that, I, I was sent, uh, subpoenaed and I had to, I was at trial with the, you know, the people who, who attacked us. Okay. While the others continued and they are the ones who ended up in Jackson, Mississippi. They're the jail. ones. Got it. Okay. Cause you didn't make it all at that far. Okay. <laughs> This is what a what a wonderful history lesson you gave us, Charles. You you lived through a really important. You were a witness. You are a part of history, um, really important part of history in a, in a couple different, at least a couple different ways. Thank you very much, Charles, for joining us. Thank you, Scott Masters, for uh, twisting Charles' arm to get us to join <laughs> join us. I hope you do join us again. Um, Thank you all for, for this wonderful conversation. I Again, once again, I feel like I've been in the company of greatness. I wish you all, Sam Black, especially, thank you for uh, joining us and sharing your expertise at the top of our program um, and setting up the context for this conversation. I wish you all a very happy Valentine's Day tomorrow, and I hope to see you all again on our program sometime. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks, Todd. Good night.